welcome to Fruity Knitting. This is episode 104. I'm Andrew. And I'm Andrea. We've got a really broad range of topics on the show today, so it's going to be a very eclectic program. We've got a great feature interview with Cecilia Campochiaro, who is the author of Sequence Knitting and Making Miles. And both these books are groundbreaking. And because they cover such very different topics, each of them is worthy of its own interview. So today we're going to learn all about sequence knitting. And in a future episode, we'll feature the Making Miles interview. So sequence knitting is all about creating beautiful textured fabrics that are based on a repeated sequence of stitches. And depending on how that sequence is set up, you can get really unique patterns. And just by changing one stitch in that sequence, you can get really interesting variations on that pattern. So you can imagine that you can have sets of patterns that are all different, but they also look related. And if you put them together, say in a large piece of fabric, like a shawl or a blanket, or even an oversized sort of drapey sweater, the effect can look really amazing. Amazing. So the Sequence Knitting book is a really good source book for knitters and designers to help them create new and interesting textured patterns. I think it's a really good interview. I'm really happy with it because it's very interesting. And I think you'll enjoy it. And then in our Knitters of the World segment, we feature an Argentinian designer who's living in Barcelona, and that's Cecilia Losada. And Cecilia has very vibrant, colourful and happy patterns, designs. <laughs> and you'll really enjoy meeting her. And then for our Meet the Shepherdess, we go to Maine in the yep, States. That's right. So we've had lots of different breeds of sheep on our Meet the Shepherdess segment. And lately, we've also had quite a few alpacas. Well, uh, Good Karma Farm in Maine, they have both sheep and alpacas, and they've actually got their very own mill so they're yeah. really proud of going right from growing the fleeces to producing the finished yarn which is really interesting yeah it's a husband and wife team and the husband Jim he's a cool guy he's obviously working in the mill but he also is really keen on sock machine knitting so he buys and sells sock knitting machines he has a collection includes some antiques going back to the 19th century which is really fun he teaches but he also does an annual four-day crank in where you can go to the farm paint up your own sock yarn and then crank out a few pairs of socks and you can also enjoy the local main lobster it sounds like a really good way to spend a long weekend yeah so that's coming up. We've also got updates on our own projects. They're all new, so that's exciting. And Andrea is teaching me the flicking technique. So we've got a short tutorial on that as well. So I've really been enjoying getting back into my knitting and I've been working on a Jennifer Bill design called Lonzolu. And Lonzolu is a tiny town in Newfoundland. <laughs> now last time, a few episodes ago, when I said Newfoundland, I got into a lot of trouble because I was saying it wrong. Yep. Since then, I have Googled it a couple of times, and I hope this is an improvement, but don't tell me off if it isn't. She's <laughs> doing her best. <laughs> you also got told off for Lons or Lou. Did I? Yeah. Okay. Oh, well. But that's French. I don't understand how Newfoundland, yeah. we should check the etymology of it. Yeah. Because why is it said so strangely? L'Anzolou is French. Don't, don't, don't ask questions or we'll right. get big paragraphs yeah, right. <laughs> in the comments. Sorry, don't answer that question. <laughs> okay, so getting back to L'Anzolou, I also looked that up on Google Maps because I love to look up remote little towns. And this little town has a population of 550 people, which is extraordinary. So I love to just look them up, see that they're in the middle of nowhere and just imagine what it's like to live in a tiny little community like that. Yep. Okay, so this design, I'm using the John Arben Yarnadelic yarn, which is his latest yarn, and it's a sport weight yarn, and it's 100% Falklands Corriadale. Comes in really exquisite colours. So when I first looked at the construction, or read through the construction of this design, I was actually quite intimidated, but it is much easier than what you might initially think, and I'm even using... A, um, my own completely different uh, gauge, like I hinted at in the last episode. And doing your own gauge on a project normally adds a whole new challenge to any project, but yet doing it with this unusual construction is still very manageable. So You think? I, I, so far, I hope. <laughs> I think, yes. But it is a really interesting, fun construction. So I want to spend a bit of time in this episode just explaining it to you because I think you'll really enjoy it. So first off, here's some pictures. It's a top-down dolman-shaped sweater, which means that the sleeves and the body are knitted together and the whole thing is knitted top-down. 
and there's a broad band of colour work that runs from one sleeve cuff up the sleeve and across the chest and then down to the other sleeve cuff and the same is done on the back. So the front and the back are pretty much identical. Then there's a thinner band of colour work that runs down the top of the sleeves from the neckline up on the shoulders right down to the bottom of the elbow. And also there's another thin band of colour work that runs along the inside of the sleeves and down the sides of the body. And that happens on both sides. And then you've got the neck band, the cuffs and the hem and they're all done in the same lace ribbed pattern. So it's a really unique design and I totally love it. So I've drawn a picture of the design because I think it's easier for me to explain a few things with a picture. It does look rather homemade, but can you hold it on both, both hands and yes. then I can... But it also shows you a little bit clearer what a dolman-shaped sweater looks like if you weren't familiar with it. So typically a dolman-shaped sweater, you've got the sleeves and the body knitted in one piece. So you don't have any sort of seaming around the, the armholes and it's not fitted, it's quite sort of loose and drapey and you get this sort of soft curve from the sleeve going down to the body. Now... Is that what you call a bat wing? Yeah. Right. That's a bat wing, exactly. So it might look a little bit out of proportion, but the cuffs don't actually go down to the, the wrists. They, they sort of stop about here. So the, the lace cuff ends a little bit on the other side of your elbows. So you can see this broad band of colour work starts at the cuff, goes up the sleeve, across the body, down the sleeve to the other cuff. So that you've got this major section of colour work there. Then you've got two long thin panels of colour work that run from the top of the neckline down the sleeves, the top of the sleeves to the cuff. So there and there. And then you've also got another two thin panels of, of um, colour work running on the inside of the sleeves and then down the body. Okay, so that gives you an idea of, of how it looks. Now, the first place that you start the whole design is on these long, thin panels of colour work here. That's really interesting. And you don't do them separately. You do them together you, in the round with two sets of steaking stitches. So I'll just show you here. This is what I did as a swatch. It's stocking stitch, so it's curling up on itself. But you can see in there, there's the pattern. So... There's two panels in there with two sets of sticking stitches. You cut them open and then you've got your two long panels. You sew them on the sewing machine. Jennifer recommends that you sew it on the sewing machine first, the steaks, and that's what I did. And that's a really fast and efficient way of doing it. And it's particularly great when you're not using a woolly wool. And I just did a small zigzag stitch on either side of the column of stitches that I wanted to cut open. And then I cut straight up the middle and then trimmed it down again, a little bit closer to the sewn edge. So once that's done, you have two long thin panels of colour work. And the next step is to pick up stitches along one edge of the panel. And that's what I'm doing here. So going back to our diagram here, you've just done, you've just made these two long thin panels of colour work and you've picked up these stitches along one edge and you're going to start at the right front right up in the corner of the neck edge here okay and then you're going to work back and forth in short rows until you get down to the bottom of the front neck edge so every time you're working back you collect a few more of those stitches that you picked up along the colour work panel and so every, every row is getting slightly longer and you do that right down to the bottom of the front neck. Then you stop and then you go to the other panel. And so you've picked up stitches all along this edge. You start at the, the left front neck edge and you start working down in, in, in uh, short rows, collecting more stitches every time you go get to the panel. And you work that right down to the bottom of the front neck edge. And then you're gonna cast on stitches at the bottom of the front neck and join them together. And from then on, you just knit back and forward. Every row is getting bigger because you're collecting some more stitches from the, the colour work panel as you go down. And you keep doing that right down to the cuff and to the top of this broad colour work pattern. And then you stop. So that's that. And then you go and pick up stitches along the other side right down the other side of that thin colour work panel. And you work the back in the same manner. So you're starting at the right neck on the back, 
working down and that everything's exactly the same except for the back neck is a little bit higher so you work that section there stop do the other side the left back work it down stop cast on stitches join them together and work them all the way down to this fat panel of color work so I'll show you what it looks like on my knitting and I've got to be a bit careful because the stitches want to fall off my needles and they're, they're kind of a little bit scrunched up so there that's a color work panel that goes down the sides like that so that's where I've picked up my row of my my stitches initially and this is a, a neck front here so you start here and you work down like this actually you hold that for me so you're working this section here then you do the same on the other side there's that panel goes down the top of the sleeve you're working down here then eventually you work right across from one cough across the chest to the other and then you do exactly the same on the back so you can see the front and the back just look exactly the same except for the front neck is slightly lower and then you're right up to the color work section down here and that's the ingenious bit because this is exactly the same on the front and the back so what she does and it's in the same position so what Jennifer gets you to do is cast on some sticking stitches here and here and you knit across in the round so you're going to knit across the front wing span through the sticking uh, sticking stitches then back across the back wing wing span through these sticking stitches and you just continue doing these very very long rows in the round so right now when you're going through here you can't actually stick your arms through the cuffs through the armholes mm -hmm. and then so that's where I'm at now I'm about halfway through that pattern here and if I sort of spread my pattern out you can see it a little bit there so that's the start of it there it's pretty exciting and then the second half she doesn't do you might think oh she's just going to do that the way she did this up here but I think she does it differently I haven't figured that out yet so I'll tell you about that in the next episode but I just want to really quickly tell you how I made the adjustments for my own gauge with this construction it's not as difficult as what you might imagine and I first of all have to say that um, the the pattern is really really detailed she does she writes everything very meticulously and her schematics have got a ton of detail on them but if you come across a, a, a pattern that doesn't have a good schematic you really can draw your own schematic and figure out ev all the measurements that you need to know based on the numbers that are actually written in the pattern so you for any little part of the design you figure out how many stitches you meant to have at that point how many rows you meant to have done at that point and using the recommended gauge you can figure out the exact length and width of that part of the design and that'll tell you what you meant to have so for me when I'm going through this most of the measurements were there but the measurement that wasn't there in the schematic was how long this panel was that's super important for me because that's the start of the pattern and I need to know that. You, no one else needs to know that unless they're doing something crazy like I am and, and changing the gauge. But because that's the starting point, it was important for, for me to know. So I just pretend I'm working at Jennifer's recommended gauge and I go to the size that's going to suit me, which is size 2. And I'm making these numbers up, but just say she says for size 2, you cast on 90 stitches. In her recommended gauge that it says this section here has to be 38 centimeters so now I know it's meant to be 38 centimeters I use my own gauge to figure out how many stitches I need and that's how I change it so basically all I did was sit down on the table with a pen and paper and Andrew there for comfort <laughs> and I just systematically went through the pattern and figured out at every stage of the pattern based on her recommended gauge how wide or how long that section was meant to be and then I translated that or recalculated it into the correct amount of stitches and rows for my gauge. So the other point for instance that I had to work on is the depth of the neck before you start doing this curve here. So when you start here you go straight down and then you start casting on a couple of stitches just to give you that little curve before you go straight across the bottom of the neck edge. I needed to know how deep did Jennifer want that. So I just look at the pattern at her recommended gauge, figure out how many rows 
you meant to have at that stage, calculate that into centimetres and then recalculate it into my gauge. And that's how I figured it out. So that's how you do it. Now I don't want to sound too cocky because I could stuff it up <laughs> and make a big mistake. And I have done a little error already right at the beginning. So my error was I am knitting at a tighter gauge, so I'm using more stitches and I chose the, the chart, the color work chart for one of the larger sizes. So that means that this panel here is slightly wider than it's meant to be for my size. And the consequence of that, because it's wider, it means that the front neck will drop lower. So um, my front neck is one centimeter lower than it's meant to be and the same with the back neck. But I'm hoping to be able to make that up simply by adding a little bit more ribbing. So it is a lot of fun. It's not as nightmarish as what it sounds to do those kind of uh, um, adjustments. adjustments yeah. But I also shouldn't be too cocky at this stage. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is a loose garment, so. Yeah, it's a loose sort of drapey garment, yeah. so you can play around. But it's a really exciting design. I'm really enjoying knitting it. I've been yabbering on for quite a long time now, so we'll take a break from me. And coming up is the knitter of the world, Cecilia Losada. <laughs> Hi, hello, my name is Cecilia Lozada. I am from Córdoba, from Argentina, but I'm living in Spain almost 20 years ago. I'm a crochet and a knitting wear designer. I love to publish my patterns so everybody can crochet and knit it. I live in a little town that is called San Pere de Rives and it's in Catalonia. With my two little kids that are called Theo and Louis and they have 10 and 5 years old. I want to share with you some of my own designs. I'm sorry that English is not my natural language but I promise that I will do my best so you can understand me. I am wearing right now the Avia Yale sweater. This is the crochet version. And this is the knitting version that I made in collaboration with Earth Yarns. When I start working in this design, I was thinking that I want to express something very important for, for South America and from my continent. So I start looking for a lot of information and I find that uh, Avia Yala was the name to, the, to designate America before it was colonized. So it's uh, proud for me. I am very proud about making this design. It's a very easy construction. It's uh, knitted bottom up and I use stranded knitting and a texture stitch to make different effects in the knitting. It's a drop, it's drop shoulder construction. So it's very easy to make and I think that can fit to everyone. The pattern comes in 10 different sizes. So I think that everybody can knit it. And also you have the Spanish and the English version. Then you can find this one, the crochet version. And this design is going to be published in a book that is called Tramando Latin America. It's a book with 20 different designers from Latin America. And I'm very proud to participate in this book. Since the last year, I'm working in a collection that is called People of the Earth. This collection starts only with one design and then I couldn't stop <laughs> to make different um, garments with this idea. The idea, the inspiration was uh, the Mapuche people from South, from South America, from Argentina and Chile. And I like it a lot. So this is the first design that it's called My Len Sweater. As you can see, it's with a color work, with slipped stitches, and also with a very easy lace stitch. The sleeves are like balloon sleeves or glove sleeves. 
this uh, design comes also in 10 different sizes and you will find also a short sleeve version that is called the Mylen t-shirt. As I told you before, I make also crochet designs. Uh, that was the way that I start designing. This is a shawl that it's called the Mayita shawl. It's inspired obviously in the Maya culture from Mexico and I like a lot to mix different colors and different techniques and stitches and, of, and also um, shapes. This, this is a, a shawl that starts with a circular shape and then transform in a triangular shape. So I hope you like it. <laughs> This is another shawl that I published last year that it's called Taquari Pora. This is inspired in the Guarani culture from the north of my country, from Argentina, and also from Paraguay, Brazil, and Bolivia. The uh, Guarani is a language that is the official language from uh, Paraguay and they are a culture, very, very rich culture. I like it a lot. I thought um, designing this shawl of uh, show some of the color of the nature from that place of the country. It's made with bamboo, so you can wear it in the summer or in the spring, and it's full of color work. I promise that when you need this shawl, there is no boring time needing it. This is one of my last designs. This one it's called Amaru. Amaru means in Quechua uh, like snake maybe in English. I think that that's the word. When I start designing this shawl I knew that the yarns uh, it will be balayage. It's a little collaboration with Melanie Berg and Pasquale Filati Naturali. It's a yarn that it's a baby alpaca and comes in beautiful, beautiful colors. And the alpaca obviously is from Peru. So I thought to make something uh, relation, um, relationate with this country. So Amaru, it uh, represents like the underground in the spirits of uh, Cuzco and you can see it here you have a lot of snakes made with a uh, mosaic knitting and this uh, is a little texture with slipped stitches and this part represents all the walls that you will find walking in Cuzco when you're walking in the street you will see a lot of places that are constructed with stones so this is what I wanted to represent in this section. This is the Coco Boxy Sweater. This design is a boxy sweater, as you can see, very, very comfortable. This design is a crochet version. So for this design, I was inspired in the huipiles from Mexico, that it's a typical garment that women uh, uh, make by their own and also they make everything by hand. Uh, I use the different techniques to make this part of here. So for this one I use intarsia and from here I used tapestry. And then I just uh, join everything, this panel and this panel from the back and I construct all the all the sweater with uh, only this part is sealed, is sealed. And I hope you like it. It's very beautiful. For this design, I use silky lace from Malabrigo because it has a very good movement, and this this was the effect that I want to create with this garment.
I really loved Cecilia's designs, the colorful, bright patterns there, particularly the Abhyayala sweater that she showed right at the beginning and also the Malin sweater. I think she had one in a sort of orange and brown colorway. Yeah, I really like that one. That's that's, good. that's really your colors. I really like the yellow and purple. Uh, in a, it was a short sleeve top there, which I thought was really cool too. She She talks about the folk influence on yeah. her designs, which is really clear and I love that. But I also like the fact that they're really modern designs. I think it's a great combination there. Yeah, and the way she separates the very vibrant, clear colours with black and white stripes. Black and white is quite strong, but it still acts as a neutral sort yep. of barrier between them. Yep. Yeah, it was good. So thanks very much, Cecilia, for your great contribution. And I just think that and she's got such a, a bubbly personality and I think if you're feeling a little bit melancholy, you should just pick up one of her patterns because they're so bright and happy and yep. and you can think of Cecilia's bubbly personality and That's I'm sure right. you'll be cheered right up. <laughs> <laughs> so Cecilia is offering Fruity Knitting Patrons a 25% discount of all her self-published patterns in her Ravelry store. So there's both crochet and knitted designs, as she said, and they include lots of summer tops, sweaters, shawls, even socks, hats and mitts. So there's quite a big collection there. So thanks very much to Cecilia. We're continuing in under construction with my Bowie top by Lisa Richardson. I did warn you in the last episode that we're in for the long haul here. It's done in the Rowan Fine Lace and it's a stocking stitch body and lace sleeves. Now, in one of the recent episodes, I did go through some calculations to figure out how many stitches I had in the project that I was doing then. And I thought people would actually find that really silly, but there was in fact quite a bit of interest. So I thought I would do it very quickly for this, at least this stocking stitch part. And what I did was simply say, all right, they're just rank rectangles. And I calculated the number of stitches based on that. And then I deducted a few stitches for the armholes and for the neck cutaway. And I came up with a figure of around 25,000 stitches for each of the front and back. So a total of around 50,000 stitches of stocking stitch. Just in the body? Just in the body, yep. So the exact figure doesn't really matter. You're actually saying I need to go up a size mm -hmm. so I can get a few more. The point is it's quite a lot of stitches. So I then did the calculation, how long would it take to knit that? And I know Andrea knits at, she says, three stitches for two seconds. So two thirds of a stitch two thirds of a second per stitch for knitting and one st second per stitch for purl. And at that rate, it would take her 12 hours of solid knitting to do the front and the back. Cause this is done knitting back in pieces. Yeah. It's, it's flat. Yeah. yeah. For me, I work at about three and a half seconds per stitch. And at that rate, I'm looking at 50 hours of solid knitting to do this top. That's assuming everything goes well. So, uh, for some time, so it's about, yeah, it's a big difference there. And if I could save, a half a second per stitch, that would save me a total of around seven hours knitting time just on the front and back. Now, for some time, Andrea has been talking about teaching me the flicking style of knitting, which in theory would let me save more knit a bit more quickly. So I figured, okay, 50,000 stitches ahead of me, I'll give it a try. So Andrea took a bit of time to teach me this technique. And I have to say the first thing that really impressed me is that as we were doing this, we both actually laughed quite a lot, which I don't take for granted <laughs> because it does take quite a little bit of patience to go through this process, I think for both of us. Yeah. So that was pretty good. On the practical side, there was one clear result immediate and that was, I found that the technique that I was using before was actually quite straightforward. And easy. And really not that slow because the flicking technique, uh, I, at first I found incredibly difficult and definitely not fast. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, the knitting, once I got going, it was kind of okay. Purling was a complete disaster. And I think the problem, well, I know the problem that I have, I've probably got lots of problems, but one problem that I definitely have is with the tension. And anyone who's watched a few episodes knows about my difficulties with tension. For the knitting, I was tight and that's kind of okay. Um, it did mean that my gauge was too small. The real problem with that is that the stitches are really tight on the needle, which makes it really hard to work with. So that's not good. The purl is a complete disaster. I actually kind of lose control of the yarn, so I can't really even get the, the yarn around the needle to make the stitch. I have made a little bit of progress there, but it was pretty bad. And I think essentially I'm just not good at doing these little things with my hands. 
But it's really good because you try something that's crazy hard and you go back to what you did in the past and it's crazy easy. Yeah. It's and the I, best way to feel good about yourself. <laughs> and I do think it's it's sort of throwing you into confronting some weaknesses in your technique. Mm. And even if I don't end up using this this technique, I'll have improved my sort of sub You've already improved. You understand yeah. How to before you just weren't using your fingers enough. You've got to use yeah. your fingers to pull to manipulate the stitches so it's easy for you in lots of different ways. I think it's actually a whole lot of little subtasks that you've got to master to make it work well. Anyway, the question now is: Do I persist in trying to learn this technique, or do I just cut my losses, go back to my old technique, and actually get on with my project? <laughs> um, and at this point, I'm going to persist. I'll be brave and have a couple more lessons with Andrea and see if our patience holds um, because I do think there are little problems there that can be solved yeah. or improved or whatever. So this is a swatch and we can't yet measure it because we've got to make sure that his knitting is a bit consistent first. Yeah, I need to get into a stable rhythm. So we'll see. Um, There's a big hole down here. <laughs> yeah, even if I did go back to the other, I think it will have been helpful. So totally. That's the stocking stitch. I do also have the yeah. lace. I've... I've I bought some extra needles so I can work on both at once. The lace, this is not TV knitting. I did... It's uh, inside out. Whoops. Oh, okay. I'll hold it. You talk. All right. So definitely not TV knitting. This takes my full concentration. It is shaped like a shawl. So it's kind of a triangle and a rounded edge. There's consistent increasing. So the pattern's actually described in 79 individual rows. So I sit at the table back there um, with the pattern on the on the table and I've Completely got... Completely blown up. Two, yeah, it's nice and big and I've got two cards blocking off so I can only see one line and then I actually have to be really careful to see where I am inside that single row that I'm working on. So, yeah. But I'm really enjoying it. I do need to try and get on top of keeping track of where I am. Got two, two uh, lifelines in yeah, and I'm doing a floss. sort of leapfrogging technique there that's all really good so I'm really enjoying that actually yeah. I've I've got through I think I've got through 37 rows there are 79 but if you have knitted a shawl you'll know that the first few rows they're kind of nothing and things just balloon out as you go down and it's a stunning looking color isn't it yeah it it's came out be great yeah I think it's going to be really good so I'm I'm enjoying it okay now because I think some of our viewers probably don't know much about the different knitting styles. I know, for instance, my mother watches our program and she's in Australia and I don't think she understands or knows anything about flicking. So I thought I'd do just a little bit of footage to show you um, two variations on flicking and also how I was taught to knit and how I originally taught Andrew. So I was taught to knit by my mother and she was taught by her mother who migrated from England to Australia in the early 1900s. And when I was a child growing up, the women who I knew in my community who knitted all, knit, all knitted with this same style of knitting. So I think this style of knitting that Andrew knits with now and what I used to knit with and, and still do sometimes, originated in some part of England, which I find fascinating. I don't have the resources, but I, would love to see a study sometime done on all the different knitting styles and how they have uh, moved around the world as people migrated and then how they mutated when in small, to be mutations of that style in small isolated communities. It's really just like the way a normal language develops. Yeah. I think it's quite fascinating. So this footage, because I wanted to keep it as short as possible, it's less about teaching you exactly how to do it and more about pointing out the differences. So again, I show you this way that we originally learned and then two variations on flicking, which is really interesting. And we also have to say that we are definitely not activists for fast knitting <laughs> or we're not slow knitting shamers. We have no. to make that clear because we do have viewers who have told us that they really enjoy knitting slowly. It's very relaxing and meditative and they do beautiful work and they've got no desire whatsoever to knit any faster. So knitting fast is not the goal unless you want it to be. But it can also be interesting just from an intellectual point to understand how fast knitting is possible, like what actually happens to make fast knitting possible. Yep. So that's coming up now and we'll see you straight after.
I've been teaching Andrew to knit in the style of flicking because I think it's the fastest method of knitting for both the knit and the purl stitch. The continental style is also very fast for the knit stitch but I think it's a little bit slower for the purl stitch and with the flicking method there isn't a big difference in movement between the knit and purl stitch which I think is a really great advantage. This is the way Andrew presently knits and this is how I originally learned to knit myself and you can go fairly fast with this method. So the right hand holds the needle like a pencil and the right hand needle rests between the thumb and the first finger and the needle sort of just slides back and forth as the hand moves forward to do the knit or purl stitch. And with this method you can also get a fairly even tension between your knit and purl stitches because they're very similar in their movements. So here you can see me doing a couple of knit stitches followed by a couple of purl stitches and they're fairly similar movements as you can see. So let's get on to flicking. Flicking is faster because you don't have big hand movements and the smaller mo the movement is the faster you can go. So far I've seen two slightly different methods of doing flicking and the first method to my understanding is very similar to how the Shetland knitter Hazel Tyndall flicks and Hazel also uses a Shetland knitting belt. That means that her right hand needle is very stable and doesn't move at all and the left hand needle does the work and kind of moves the stitch on and off the needle like a shuttle. And in this method, the left hand thumb and the first finger are, are fairly dexterous, so they're also moving the stitches up towards the end of the needle. And the right hand thumb holds the stitch that's just been worked, and this creates a good tension between the stitch and the working yarn. And also the right hand first finger just does a slight sideways movement to flick the yarn around the needle. And when you do the purl in this method, the right hand first finger actually has to do a greater movement than it does in the knit stitch, and that's slightly more awkward. But of course, I'm showing you very slowly so you can kind of understand the movements. But if you watch Hazel's videos, which I highly recommend that you do, you can see Hazel knit and purl very, very fast. It's kind of like a blur. So this method is definitely very effective and efficient knitting. I've seen a slight variation on flicking and this is what I'm teaching Andrew to do. So with this flicking style, it uses slightly bigger movements than the traditional flicking style that I've just shown you, but there's very little difference between the knit and purl stitch and I think that's a really big advantage. And it's the reverse to the previous method where the left hand needle is now held stable and the right hand needle does quite a lot of swinging. And the right hand needle goes from being roughly at a 90 degrees angle with the left hand needle to being to swinging down to be around a 45 degrees angle in comparison to the left hand needle. So the tip of the right hand needle is now going straight up. And, that, and you do that by just pushing down on the needle and it sort of swings down and then you swing it back up again. And when you purl in this way, it's a really similar movement. So you can see I'm doing a couple of knit stitches followed by a couple of purl stitches and they're very, very similar movements. And I'm showing you just very slowly so that you can kind of see it. And it's a bit exaggerated. You don't need to stick uh, the ends of your needle quite in so far. So my biggest tip is just to start really slowly and closely watch each step of the process and just refine each movement so it becomes less movement, more efficient and try to have the movements very smooth and have your hands and your fingers as relaxed as possible. If you can do all of that just very, very efficiently, then it's extremely easy for the brain to speed things up. So for example, here's a, a video clip of me playing the piano when I was 20, so that's 30 years ago. And to play this fast, you don't actually practice this fast. You take the, the section of music that you want to play fast and you practice it extremely slowly. So you're watching exactly what you're doing, refining the movements, making sure that you're doing any jumps in the shortest possible way, so going directly there and that your fingers and hands are as relaxed as possible. And if you can do that just perfectly, extremely slowly, 
the brain can speed it up super fast and yet that's how you get to be very fast. And I think that's the same method for many different types of physical skills. So that was Andrea's overview of flicking and the other techniques. I'm curious to see how this experiment will turn out. Makes me think of My Fair Lady with Henry Higgins and Eliza. Eliza Doolittle. Yep. Teaching you how to speak better. That's right. Just you wait, <laughs> Henry Higgins. Just you wait. I think I'm having just as much fun playing with you as yeah. he had playing with her. Yeah, but he was a bit naughty, though. Yeah, well, this is a bit naughty, too. <laughs> okay. So producing this show is our full-time job and it is only possible through the financial support of patrons. And it is very inexpensive to become a patron. You can do so by making a small, regular, monthly contribution. And it is a difficult time right now and every single patron makes a real difference to us. So please do become a patron so that we can continue on with the show and thank you to all of the wonderful viewers who have done just that. We really appreciate it. Yep. Hi, I'm Amy Grant. And I'm Jim Grant. <laughs> Together we own Good Karma Farm. Uh, we're a 40-acre farm in the mid-coast area of Maine, located halfway up the Maine coast. Um, in 1992, I started a screen printing and embroidery business. A couple of years later, Amy came to work for me, with me, and... Uh, Together we ran that business for almost 20 years, and after a while it was time for a change. We just got burned out and we're looking for something new to do. Uh, we started raising alpacas uh, as a hobby during that time, and uh, we, we were sending our alpaca fiber off to a local mill to be spun into yarn. And it seemed to be that a real need, there seemed to be a real need for custom fiber processing. And uh, so we thought, well, maybe this is something we'd like to do. And uh, we started a mill thinking we would process other people's fiber, but very quickly realized how much fun it was to do our own. So that's the direction that we headed at that point. We raise uh, Icelandic sheep, fin sheep, and alpacas here. Um, Icelandic sheep we chose because they're a smaller breed. Uh, we like their quirky personalities. Um, they're considered to be a primitive breed, which is, I think, a nice way of saying that they don't always do what they're told. Um, they, uh, they like to roam and a good fence is very important, uh, but they're very good mothers and, uh, frequently have twins and triplets. So they're, they're very good at, at that. Uh, they, um, have a, they're two coated fleece. Uh, they have a, a finer, shorter inner coat that averages about 20 microns and, uh, and the outer coat is longer and finer. And we spin the two together to make a, to make a single ply of yarn. Um, we also raise fin sheep. And fin sheep are also a small breed. They um, are in Finland known as Finnish land race. Uh, I don't think they're considered primitive, but even if they are, they definitely are much more manageable at times than the Icelandics. Uh, they're very friendly and they're really great ambassadors for our farm. Their fleece is perfect for blending. It's about four to five inches uh, long, the staple length, and the micron is, uh, averages around 24. Uh, we try to breed for lighter colors for, uh, for dyeing purposes. And then the alpacas, um, we stopped breeding alpacas five or six years ago and decided we would only buy or rescue alpacas. And uh, we blend their fiber uh, with with our wool. People ask us which is easier, alpacas or sheep, and we say neither. They're just very different. Uh, 
They, um, we have all the alpacas and sheep together. Uh, they run together perfectly well and get along great. The only issues we have sometimes is uh, we have one alpaca named Delilah, and she has never had any babies of her own, but she's super protective of the lambs. So if we have new lambs born, we have to be looking over our shoulder for Delilah because she can be a little overprotective at times. We also have a goat named Earl and a llama named Doolittle. Yes. <laughs> so... How do you start a mill? We didn't have any idea what the first thing was to do when we sold our other business. So we decided to, we went to East Mich we went to East Jordan, Michigan to the Stonehenge Fiber Mill that was run by Chuck and Debbie McDermott. And we worked for them for a week to see if we were going to enjoy this whole thing. And uh, we came back to Maine and we were really positive about it. We liked it. And so <clears throat> we talked to Chuck about ordering some equipment. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so we got a carter. Chuck said he wouldn't make any new equipment if there was equipment out there. So we got a McDermott carter from a couple in New York State that were getting out of the business. We got a uh, Warner Squazy pin grafter that was made in the 1960s. Um, and that's one of our most unique pieces to get us the type of yarn that we want to have. Um, normally they come with a coiler so that the sliver comes out and coils all up into it. Well, ours didn't have one, so we get a lot of loft into our yarn because it's not coiled up and piled up. Um, and from the pin drafter, it goes onto the spinning frame, and we have an eight head spinning frame that was um, made in South Carolina by Carolina Specialties that we spin and ply on. And then we have a McDermott skein winder we also have another skein winder that was headed for the uh, trash heap when we rescued it. A business, went, uh, a company went out of business in Massachusetts. We had to cut it down, um, put it back together, and get it to work in our mill, which worked out really well. And it's a huge time saver um, as we explain our dyeing process. But after we dye everything, it gets skeined off again. And this is what we can use that machine for. Uh, one of the big issues we have with both the carter and the pin drafter is static electricity. And ideally, we try to maintain a relative humidity of between 50 and 60 percent. But our mill is located in our barn, and this used to be an old milking parlor. So it's very difficult to get the, um, the relative humidity to be in that range, especially in the winter. So static is something that can just drive you crazy. But um, we, yeah. over, over the years, we, we've gotten better at it. Um, I do all the dyeing, and here I don't know why that is because Jim actually has the art background, not me. And uh, but back when we had the screen printing business, uh, we printed with water-based inks, and we had to mix those uh, colors to match Pantone colors, and that was my job. So I guess I learned a little bit about how dyes behave, and um, and I we realized that we needed to keep the colors as consistent as possible, which requires really exact measuring and of both the dye and the yarn, and that um, we needed good record keeping. So I guess that's more up my alley, and that's how it felt to me. And it's really fun, I enjoy it. Um, so we dye all of our yarn uh, after it's spun. And before um, we dye it, we have to spin it. And so we spin three different types of yarn here. Right. So, so we've got a worst of weight yarn, which is a two ply, 210 yards, 60% wool, 40% alpaca blend. Uh, we do a sport weight, which is the same 60 40 blend, but it's 400 yards in a three ply. And then we do a sock yarn, which is 100% wool that we spin tighter so that it will wear longer. And then these are all individually hand painted. So it all comes out as white. And then that's when Amy takes the dye pots. Yeah, and different different shades, obviously. It's not all pure white. Right. So we have different color of animals here. And that affects the the final color once it's dyed as well. Um, we dye in 100-quart stainless steel pots. Typically, and our dye lots are usually around 36 skeins. Um, we use acid dyes, and we use either uh, vinegar or citric acid. Um, and... The sock yarn, as Jim mentioned, is all hand painted, and uh, both he and I do the hand painting, and our daughter Zoe helps with that too sometimes. And it's interesting because uh, we'll mix up nine or ten different colors, and each of us approaches the the painting differently. So you have a completely different outcome. Everybody sees color differently and has different ideas. And I would say that the one 
piece of advice in to be successful dying is to not be afraid of color and to be willing to take risks. And I think that's something we've been able to do really well. Yep. And uh, the reason that we make a sock yarn, and it's spelled S-O-X because it's not a true sock weight. Um, I did a lot of socks on a circular sock machine, and that's what this yarn is good for. Uh, well, it's good for all socks, but it runs very smoothly through these machines. Um, I'm a big baseball fan, so it was spelled S-O-X, and it's just to be different than a regular sock yarn. So we have lots of different sock machines. Um, our oldest one is from 1867, which is a Bickford, um, and our newest one is from 2019. And I started on the sock machines to get women to take me seriously at fiber shows. Um, there was a lot of reverse discrimination that... You know, what could this guy know about making yarn, you know? Um, so we would do a show and everybody would want to talk to Amy. No one would ever want to talk to me. So, because I didn't have any credit. So I decided to learn how to use a sock machine. Um, we had a friend who had a, a sock machine in her barn. She let me take it. And I tried to teach myself how to crank socks from a 1920s manual. It was slow going to say the least. I made lots and lots of mistakes. Um, I finally got the hang of it. Um, I can make a pair of socks now in 45 minutes. And this has evolved into me starting a sock school. So I teach other people that have machines, um, you know, what to do with them, troubleshoot them, get them going again. I buy and sell machines. And then we've, uh, this would have been our ninth year of our annual crank in where we have people from all over the country and Canada come to our farm for four days and crank socks and paint yarn and laugh and talk and teach and learn and eat lobsters and um, it's a great time. This year we've had to, unfortunately have had to cancel it due to the pandemic, but we now are doing a virtual crank in that we already have over 500 people signed up for. Um, and we really appreciate Andrea and Andy inviting us to participate in this uh, great podcast. And, uh, and we really encourage everyone to come visit us. We love to have visitors. and uh, Virtual too. Virtual visitors too. We're yeah. on Facebook. <laughs> and we take a lot of pride in doing this from start to finish, from raising the animals to what we made for our base yarns. Then Amy's colors are incredible. We are always hearing about how unique Everything we do is, and we look forward to doing more of it. Yeah, so come visit us in Belfast. Thank you. Andrew's doing his flicking on the pearl side, so... Don't look. <laughs> don't look it's, and don't count how yeah, long it takes. No timing. I've got to say, I did a row of knit stitches and they're so tight, I can hardly get them <laughs> along with a needle. So. And listen, anyway. Andrew is a really strong character, so you don't need to feel like... Um, yeah, but don't push it, though. <laughs> he can take a bit of, of teasing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, we'll talk about this afterwards. <laughs> yeah, anyway, no counting and no looking. Thanks very much to Jim and Amy. I really enjoyed their segment. And I thought the, the barn where they were filming themselves looked just so atmospheric and rustic, but I could imagine it's freezing in winter, the yeah. old milking barn. Yep. Yeah. Also I, those, uh, those sock knitting machines. Yeah. They're so cool. Yeah, they looked really good all in a row on the shelf. Yeah, you said you hadn't seen one before. No. That surprises me. Yeah, I've never seen them. Would you like to do that? I would like to give it a go, particularly with one of those old machines. I think I love those old machines. All of I like going to John Arbin's mill and that yeah, sort of stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But I wouldn't do it exclusively. Well, I would wear any amount of socks that you could possibly knit, and you heard that he can crank one out, a pair out in 45 minutes. That would make you so happy. That would make me super happy. <laughs>
<laughs> it's pretty incredible, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. So I think their retreat, four-day retreat of painting sock yarn and, and cranking out socks and eating lobster just sounds like a whole lot of fun. Yep. Yeah. So Jim and Amy are offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 15% discount off all their yarn, which, as they said, includes worsted and sport weight yarn and their special hand-painted sock yarn. So enjoy looking through the Good Karma Farm store. What a great name, Good Karma. It's a happy yep. name. And thanks very much to Amy and Jim. So coming up now is our interview, feature interview with Cecilia Campochiaro. I was really impressed with Cecilia on all different levels. But first of all, just working with her, was she was simply fantastic. Mm -hmm. She was very easy and accommodating and very, very cheerful, which makes it a real delight. She was a real delight to work with. Yep. And she's also, she's got a very intellectual mind, but she's also very humble and personable. So I, I could imagine if you get a chance to have a class with her, you'll feel very much at ease and have a really good time. Yep. The other thing I found was very interesting is just sitting during the interview and listening to her describe sequence knitting in more detail. My understanding of it really increased and there, therefore my appreciation of the technique really increased. And I think you'll find the case as well. Now, Cecilia has arranged a discount on her book, Sequence Knitting, for Fruity Knitting Patrons. Two of her distributors are offering a 20% discount on the book. So in the States, Schoolhouse Press is offering the discount. Schoolhouse Press is an online store with a fantastic range of top knitting-related books and European yarns that are harder to get in the States. And in Europe... Ito Yarn and Design is offering a 20% discount on the sequence knitting book. So Ito Yarn and Design is a wholesale stockist of luxury Japanese yarns, patterns and products, and they're based in Berlin. So thank you very much to both distributors and to Cecilia. Okay, so now is the interview and we're going to see you in a couple of weeks. Yep, thanks for being with us today. Ready. Bye. Bye. Knitting. Our guest today is Cecilia Campochiaro, who is the author of the book Sequence Knitting, Simple Methods for Creating Complex Fabrics, and the book Making Miles, which is a source book for multi-strand hand knitting. Cecilia is relatively new in the knitting scene, and although she's had a lifelong interest in textiles, photography, and the arts, her professional background was in Silicon Valley, where she developed specialised microscopes used in computer chip manufacturing. So it's great to see such an analytical mind being applied to the field of hand knitting. Her books are groundbreaking, and because they cover very different topics, each of them is worthy of its own interview. So her first book was Sequence Knitting, and that was published in 2015. So we'll start with that book for today's interview. And in a follow-up interview, we'll cover Making Miles. So welcome, Cecilia. It's really great to have you on Fruity Knitting. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much. It's such a joy to, to be here. And I appreciate so much you inviting me. So what is sequence knitting and how can it benefit the knitter? Sequence knitting, in its essence, is taking a sequence of stitches like Knit 2, Purl 2 and just repeating them in some rule, with some rule and when you repeat them over and over again, a fabric happens. And I think the, the classic example that I like to give people is just two by two ribbing. You're repeating knit two, purl two according to some rule and the ribbing happens. And if you change that sequence or you change the rule, all kinds of other fabrics happen. And that's the, the kind of the joy and the fascination of sequence knitting. So how did you come up with the idea and how did it all get started? Well, it really, it started with this scarf 
This is Stephanie Pearl McPhee's One Row Hand Spun Scarf Pattern. And I was looking for something to do beyond ribbing. I was working in uh, high tech and doing a lot of business travel and making a lot of ribbing scarves. And I wanted something more interesting. And I had a lot of beautiful yarn I had collected at uh, places like Stitches. And um, this, uh, this pattern was on the internet. She published it oh, more than 10 years ago. And she had done it from her own hand spun. And it was knit to, knit through the back, purl on a multiple of four plus two stitches. And it made this beautiful fabric that kind of laid flat and was exactly the same on both sides. And it wasn't ribbing and I was absolutely charmed. And it just got me on the journey of saying, what would happen if I changed the sequence? And ultimately what would happen if I changed the rule? And it, it uh, I think it's still one of my favorite pieces even to this day, not just because of the memory, but because it's such a beautiful stitch pattern and done in beautiful yarn. And all sequence knitting with knits and pearls is reversible, isn't it? So all of the patterns that you come up with are reversible fabrics, is that right? Well, that's a great question. So reversible means that you like both sides. So yes, okay. <laughs> it, with that definition, 100%, there are some sequence knitting patterns that are not the same on both sides. I would say um, for one row patterns and for um, serpentine method, uh, and even the shape one row method, which we'll talk about, I know in a little bit, the fabrics are usually the same on both sides. When you knit in the round, they can often be quite different on both sides. And you've broken down sequence knitting into different methods and you just said some of them there, the serpentine and the one row and spiral, etc. Can you explain those to us and show us some more examples? Sure. So I'll just, so just to say, this is a, I call this a mistake rib uh, because this has uh, ribs and ditches with a spacer in between the ribs. Uh, so this is a one kind of one row pattern, but my favorite one row pattern really comes from this, uh, this family of uh, stitch patterns, which I call broken garter. And this is the simplest broken garter. And this is also called seed stitch. So this is just seed stitch worked in a uh, different color every two rows. So this is knit one, purl one, where every row is begun knit one, purl one on a multiple of two plus one or an odd number of stitches. But I love this series because I'll just pick these up here and show you. So this is knit one, purl one. This is knit two, purl two. That's beautiful. And then knit three, purl three. Can you see what's happening to the stitch pattern? As I make the sequence go knit one, purl one, knit two, purl two, knit three, purl three. And then ultimately I'll just show the last one here, knit 12, purl 12. The, the repeat widens and it goes from this little tick, tick, tick of, of a seed stitch to these big railroad tracks. Yeah. And I think yeah, that's really... Beautiful. Uh, really a lot of fun. They look very good together. They would look good in a big blanket, like big swatches in a big blanket. Oh, you know, I have been um, plotting my broken garter blanket for years now. <laughs> There's so many, so many uh, color, color and pattern choices, but one of these days, absolutely right. It's perfect for a blanket because it lays flat, perfect for baby blankets, any kind of blanket. So what's the difference between spiral and serpentine and shaped one row, etc.? Okay, so one row is just like it sounds. You, you, you begin every row with the sequencing, you run it across the row, and at the end there'll be some uh, piece of a sequence. It could be complete or it could be incomplete, but the next row you restart the sequence. For the um, shaped one row, and here's an example of shaped one row. This is a shawl called Rizumu. Um, in this case, you cast on three stitches and you begin every row with the sequence. And when you get to the end of the row, you do a double increase. So every row, the, um, the stitch count grows by two stitches. And then when you repeat the sequence across the rows, the way the knits and purls line up is different. You get this really rich um, textured pattern. So this is shaped one row. So that's your, you're applying shaping at the end of the row. You can make triangles and parallelograms with this approach. Okay. And then, and then um, the next one is uh, serpentine. And here's an example of serpentine. This is a little bit dark here. I hope you can see it well. We'll have a photograph as well to show you. But this is um, a zigzag pattern, a really strong zigzag pattern. And this is from serpentine. And in serpentine, you begin the sequence on the first row. At the end of the first row, it's incomplete, but you complete it on the next row. So if you think about it, when you knit back and forth knitting, 
the yarn is making a serpentine as you knit. Think about yeah. the little loops, yeah. but the yarn's ultimately making a serpentine. So in sequence knitting serpentine method, the sequence follows the yarn. So the sequence goes around the bends. And then you also get wonderful ways that the stitch patterns can fold upon themselves. And that gives you these really interesting textural uh, patterns that you could never get with a one row pattern. Yeah, so you, you see that over time, it's a, a large emotive sort of forms, doesn't it, with the serpentine? Yeah, absolutely. And it could be anywhere from a two row repeat to a very large row repeat. This, this particular pattern called maze has a 18 row repeat. So that's a really uh, big row repeat, but you're just repeating that one sequence in perpetuity following the line of the yarn. Okay, and spiral, is that where you're using it in, by knitting in the round or? Absolutely, so you, you, you cast on a certain number of stitches and you, you join in the round and you just repeat the sequence in perpetuity. And I usually do put a marker just so I can count the rounds, but you, run the sequence right through the marker. You don't restart the sequence at the marker. And if you cast on an even number of stitches, and when I say even, imagine the sequence had 12 stitches in it. If you cast on a multiple of 12, mm -hmm. you will always get some kind of ribbing. And this is an example of a hat where the sequence is knit two purl two twice and knit one purl one twice. And you can see that it's ribbing. If you add just one stitch, you get something called a swirl. So ah. the only difference between these two hats is one stitch was added. Wow. <laughs> and as you continue to add stitches, you get different textures. And this is, and ultimately there's 12 stitches in the sequence. So ultimately there should be 12, 12 different textures. But in this case, there, I, I haven't done half of them because they're the same. They just swirl the opposite direction. But, uh, and here's the halfway point. Here's uh, 12 plus six stitches. They look so good all held up together. Isn't that fun to see the series? I, I think that, I think you really kind of understand how sequence knitting works when you can see a series like this. That's fantastic. Okay, so there really is almost no limit to the pattern alternatives that are possible in uh, sequence knitting and you cover a huge collection in your book. Um, I think some of them definitely look clearer than others. So I'd love you to talk about some more of your favorites. And can you also say what type of sequence is more likely to create a, an aesthetically pleasing result? Uh, that's a great question. And it's, it's a, a question that I, I, I think about it all the time because I think of myself as a miner, kind of mining. I mean, these sequences just are, right? I mean, you, you repeat the sequence according to a rule. That's really math. And then, but you want to make a beautiful textile. So I think of myself as a miner trying to figure out which of these sequences and rules would lead to a beautiful textile. And I think there's a couple of things that, that matter. One is if the stitch patterns fold upon themselves to bake ribs, often the ribs are quite beautiful. So you can always look at the, so I always look at the chart. I always make a chart first and I look for seeing a rib. And then the second thing I look for in the chart is I look for pockets of, um, stockinette. If you see like a little two by two or three by three or some triangle of stockinette or reverse stockinette in the chart, the way those are manifest in the knitting will often be quite lovely because they will pucker in or out and they'll give the fabric a three-dimensional quality. If the fabric just looks like a kind of a big, if the chart of the fabric just looks like a big jumble, the fabric will probably look like a big jumble too. Uh, but there's another caveat, uh, which is if the chart looks messy, what that also says is you need to have a large expanse of the fabric to understand how it would, how it could be beautiful. If you, the, the more simple the chart, the more viscerally important a small piece of fabric will be, the more complicated the chart, the more you need to knit a big piece of it to begin to see the repeats and see what it could provide. Okay, show, that makes a lot of sense. I'm going to show you, I've got a, uh, an example here. This is a piece called Hadrian's Wall. And this is a piece where um, it was knit in a, in a yarn called Soft Donegal, which was a, uh, made in the Donegal Tweed factory in Ireland from Merino instead of from the traditional Donegal wool. So it looks like the Donegal, but in fact it is uh, much softer, but it has mm -hmm. that kind of a uh, stony look that is so beautiful. And if you look at the fabric, it's a gray fabric with black, yellow, white flecks on it. 
and the flex kind of hide the stitch pattern, but it's a very beautiful, fascinating stitch pattern. And the chart for this stitch pattern is also really, really interesting. And this is one of those stitch patterns that you can, you know, of course you can do, it's a stitch pattern. You can do it in any yarn and any gauge, but this is really one of my very, very favorite ones. And part of it's because the chart is so curious and then seeing that chart manifest in the knitting is so, uh, so wonderful. And is it an easy one? Is it sort of knitterly to knit? Or do you, is it one that you have to really um, keep markers in and, and pay attention to? Well, that's a good question. So serp serpentine, the serpentine rule, the fabrics made from the serpentine rule are by far the most difficult sequence knitting to do. And part of that is because you're building up this very complicated all over texture and at a row by row level, it can be pretty hard to read the knitting and it's pretty hard to catch a mistake. But this particular pattern, because the pattern is more visceral and because it has a pretty clear repeat, I think it's on the easier end of the spectrum for serpentine fabric. But you know, serp serpentine, any kind of textured knitting that you're gonna work on, I think you you have to kind of understand it. It's not the easiest knitting to, to do a, a, hev a heavy, complicated texture. But uh, you know, it's often worth the trouble. It's a great name for it too. <laughs> have you been there? Have you seen Hadrian? <laughs> I have Hadrian? been there. I yeah. have seen Hadrian's Wall, and it's uh, what a beautiful part of the world that uh, part of England and, and Scotland. It's just gorgeous. The book describes sequence knitting in terms of knit and purl stitches. Um, when I look through the book and look through all of the charts my mind just keeps thinking, oh, this would look fantastic in color work, particularly the really complicated ones. I think they would look fantastic in color work. So have you explored sequence knitting with these other techniques like color work or possibly even lace? Yeah, I have. I've done uh, quite a bit of exploring. In fact, in the initial plane of sequence knitting right after I had knit Stephanie Pearl McPhee's scarf, uh, I'd say my swatches were probably half lace, just trying to understand how lace looked. Uh, and then um, I've also done a fair amount of stranded color work in sequence knitting. I haven't published any yet, but I'm going to give you a sneak peek of a little hat just to give you an idea. So this is a, so I showed you the swirl here in, um, in the Sarah hats. So this idea of a swirl is something that you always get in spiral method whenever you're one stitch off of even. So yeah. if you have Right, so that's that's always going to happen. This is an example of a uh, hat that is um, done in stranded knitting. That is instead of doing knits and pearls, it's color A, color B, and you can see that it's also making that beautiful swirl. So it's stunning! This, that looks really classy. Yeah, it's really a fun fun way to play, and you you can do it. But of course, the only thing you have to think about, like any sequence knitting, is if you break the rule, the pattern will change, and you won't be able to to just make it this way. Uh, so you have to have the stitch count be constant throughout this part where you're doing the pattern, and that's why that's why I switch to a solid color top because when you get into the shaping, if you look at at Fair Isle patterns, you have a chart that you're following and you're doing the top according to the chart. And I wanted to have a freedom from charts, which meant uh, make the parts that change just one color. Okay, that's very exciting. So that might possibly be another book, do you think? <laughs> Perhaps, you never know. <laughs> and then here's a, here's a piece I published a few years ago with Amarisu Magazine called Ishoni. And this is a, a, a mesh pattern, basically. And this is, if you look at it, this is two uh, interlocked parallelograms or so two interlocked triangles and one of them has an odd stitch count and one of them has an even stitch count and what that means is that the mesh is actually a little bit different pattern it's hard for me to see it here so i'll have to send you a detailed photograph to to see it better but um it's it's one of these things where your knitting is identical but because the stitch count is odd for one triangle and even for the other you get two different meshes and of course here they're just interlocked uh, into two triangles um, so, so lace is something you can have a lot of fun with. The only thing I'll say is that holes are a very big visual statement and um, you don't have as much latitude with lace, I think, as you do with knits and pearls, just because the holes are such a big statement, they kind of become the whole story. So I, I love working with sequence knitting lace, but it often becomes um, kind of all over meshes. Often you think you think of uh, lace being read down horizontally as well as vertically, and if you're doing a sequence that's just running um, horizontally with lace, you might you might end up with a, a bit of a crazy picture in a way. 
Would, is that right? So when I think of a mesh, I really think of something where the holes are everywhere. I mean, you can see you can see through this fabric because it's just so full of so full of holes. So that that's what that, so that's that's what I think we're saying the same thing. That's exactly what happens. Is it just it devolves to mesh? Now you could do bands of stockinette or garter, and then do bands of sequence knitting, and then you could have that would be ways to to break it up. But I think if it it always I mean think about a sequence like knit five yarn over and knit two together. So that's in terms of the yarn overs, that's only one in seven of the stitches, but you repeat it across a row, then you repeat it on the next row. That's a lot of yarn overs. I can see that. Okay, so have you seen um, any designers uh, use these techniques in their design since the, the book has been published? There have been quite a few who have used it. And, and, and by the way, I, I think the reason why you write a book is because you want people to use the ideas. If you, if you wanted to keep the ideas to yourself and not share them with the world, you wouldn't write a book. You'd just publish your own patterns using the ideas and keep it all pretty quiet. But the reason for doing the book is to get people excited about it and to get them to also expand on it. And I, I think one designer I'd like to highlight is, is Lori Versace. She, um, she shares my love of Broken Garter, that series of scarves I showed you a few minutes ago, and has really taken it to new levels with doing, uh, she did a scarf she called Sequences where she uh, used increases and decreases to make broken garter wedges. And she also has done intarsia with broken garter where she gets these beautiful railroad tracks in different colors next to each other with intarsia. Oh, gorgeous. But you know, really kind of expanded on the on the concept. Uh, another designer in Europe, Jo Schmoll, has made a beautiful yoked sweater where she's done broken garter uh, in the in the yoke pattern. Uh, Michelle Wang did a beautiful scarf called Binary for Brooklyn Tweed a few years ago where she did some serpentine patterns. So people have used it. I, I don't know that it's become part of, I, I think probably, I, I perceive that most knitters still haven't really thought about sequence knitting or know what it is. So I would love to see more people use it and more people explore it. You also mentioned when we were talking before that sometimes they designers have taken the concept and then reverted it back to charts maybe because that's what their mind is used to working on and somehow that sort of loses the beauty of, of uh, sequence knitting. Say something about that. Yeah I think um, most uh, people who write patterns or yarn companies who publish patterns they have a style sheet and they have a way that they do things because they want to standardize and you know, in the knitting world, for sure, standardization is really helpful because when we all speak in the same language, we understand things better. But I think sequence knitting is uniquely able to be written in a very succinct way and understood in a very succinct way. And when you understand it that way, it makes it easier to do. And when you write it the old fashioned way, like for example, if you imagine that maze pattern that I showed you, if you wrote that as an 18 row pattern, it would be very different than understanding that you're simply repeating that sequence on every row. So the thing I would love to see is not only more adoption of sequence knitting, but uh, more of an adoption of the of the shorthand notation in sequence knitting. You know, I uh, I often love the fact that I could write a pattern in one sentence. Now there may be a paragraph or two on tips and tricks to think about it to make it more knittable and to to make it. Uh, easier to catch mistakes because that's the main of sequence knitting is you make a mistake and then you don't realize it fast enough. But being able to write it succinctly in that one or two sentences, that's the beauty of it. And then you understand the architecture of how the fabric is created. So you can actually just have your little note of paper with the, the little tiny sequence written on <laughs> and carry that around with you. I often use little paper key tags, just little, little paper discs with a metal band around them and I'll pin them to my knitting and it will be the whole pattern just on that little paper disc. Cecilia, you started teaching also to, partly to promote sequence knitting and also to promote the book, but you said that it turned out to be a really great experience for you as well. So what kinds of things did you learn through teaching sequence knitting in workshops? Well, let, let, me, let me preface that by saying that uh, when I wrote sequence knitting, I was working full-time in high tech. I had, a, I had a wonderful job. I was traveling, I was very busy. And I had never taught a knitting class in my life. I was really doing it completely in a bubble. And once it came out, then of course I began teaching for, for promotion purposes. And the first thing that I realized was that explaining the concepts to humans um, was dif different than trying <laughs> to get them on paper and trying to get them clear in my own mind. 
And it really taught me about how to explain things and how to say things in a way that was understandable by a wide range of knitters. Uh, knit, knitting, teaching knitting is really not easy. It's different than teaching, for example, in a corporate environment or a classroom environment, because in a corporate or classroom environment, people have to be there. They have no choice. They didn't kind of choose to yes. go. And also, everybody is at a certain level. If it's grade school, you know, you're, you've marched along, you've graduated from the previous year. Uh, if it's corporate life, it's usually one very narrow topic for a one-day seminar of some kind. But in knitting, you get people all the way from uh, completely new knitters who are coming to an event maybe for the first time in their life and they're not even completely sure how to cast on, all the way through to people who have been knitting for 40 years and have knit, you know, 20 Fair Isle sweaters and 10 Aran sweaters and you know can knit better than I ever could. So it's it's a it's a challenging group of people to handle as a teacher. Uh, and then some people get things very quickly and other people other people you you watch the you watch for the light bulb moment. And this is actually my favorite thing is you come into a class and you start talking about these concepts and about half of the people kind of nod at you and half of the people look at you blankly. And over the course of the half day or the day, the people who looked at you blankly have light bulb moments. And I haven't had a class yet where not everyone has come to, where everyone has come to that light bulb moment before the end of the class. Some people don't get there till the very end of the class, but seeing that aha, is really one of life's joys is really yeah, very uh, rewarding <laughs> it is and and the other thing that's interesting is seeing where people make mistakes and where people struggle and in the book sequence knitting i didn't talk about how to avert mistakes it's just a subject that wasn't addressed partly because even though i had had the trouble i didn't think about it as a topic but I think that as I write my next book, which I think will also be about sequence knitting, it'll be about more, more ways to make beautiful fabric with sequence knitting, there's gonna be a lot more discussion about what makes knitting pleasurable and how you know you're on track, which is part of the pleasure. If, you, if you're knitting along and you're fretting that you made an error, you, um, you're, it's not gonna be as much fun as if you know you're on track. And, and I think the, the Achilles heel in sequence knitting is really the serpentine method. So let me just pull this scarf back up again. So we talked about this May scarf, and this is a really beautiful, bold zigzag. I think it's one of the most um, beloved serpentine patterns. Some people have made whole sweaters in this pattern, in this stitch pattern, uh, but it's an 18 row repeat. So uh, how do you do something like this and keep your sanity? And so I've come to a, a modification of sequence knitting for serpentine method where I, I write out the, it actually, even though it's 18 rows in the knitting, it's nine rows. So I write a nine row pattern where I write how each row begins and ends. And then in the middle of the row, you're just running the sequence across the row. And even at the end of the row, that partial sequence follows. So you really just have to know how the rows begin, but you've written down also how they end. So if you get to the row and it didn't end correctly, you know, uh oh, I have a problem. So it's a little bit of a hybrid between kind of old fashioned row by row knitting and sequence knitting. Uh, and that, 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 that tip, tips and tricks like that, I think have made a big difference. Um, in, in spiral sequence knitting, uh, one interesting important thing is the sequence that you're knitting is always on top of the same stitches. For example, if you're doing a knit two, purl two spiral, the knit two is always on top of a purl and a knit, a purl and yes. a knit, a purl and a knit. So in yes. spiral knitting, it's actually very easy to know you're on track because as you knit along, yeah. you're always got to be on top of the same stitches over and over and over again. See, that's how I memorize. I love to do complicated patterns and I memorize the row and I also memorize what it's going to look like against the row below. So you're doing it in two directions. So that means you can't go knit too many stitches without going wrong or without seeing that you're going to do something wrong. Right, and I think ser serpentine is the one area where that gets the trickiest, but in the other methods, in, in one row patterns, that's completely straightforward because it's always the same. And in uh, spiral, it's quite straightforward. And in the triangles, you can, um, like for example, in this pattern here, um, this pattern in the knitting is a three row repeat, and you can talk about how the sequence is on top of different stitches in each of the three rows. So very much like what you just talked about. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so I'd like to go just slightly off topic, but it is something that um, you do cover in the book. And that is, you wrote that in your quest to avoid variegated yarns that pulled, you actually started to hand dye yarn yourself. 
So just two questions about that. Were you experimenting with variegated yarns in connection with sequence knitting? And, and secondly, can you just tell us, you know, why does some variegated yarns pull or why do they pull? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you roll back the clock to maybe 2010, variegated yarns were, in, in America, I mean, in, in people interested in knitting, hand-dyed variegated yarns were uh, explosive in their popularity. And there were all sorts of businesses that were starting up that were people doing uh, hand dyeing of, of yarn. And there were um, the, the, the mostly one woman businesses, and I think it's pretty hard work. I know it's pretty hard work to dye yarn because I've dyed enough of it myself to know that it would be hard to do it for a living. But the way most yarn is dyed is you've got a skein in a loop and you take, you take ten, usually five or 10 loops and you lay them on a table squashed, like squashed O's side by side, and then you paint the dye across those O's, right? And when you do it that way, what's happening is a color is repeating at least twice, or, or maybe if it's at the tip once, around that loop. So if the loop is a meter, then you know every meter you're gonna to come to that color again. And depending on how the width of your knitting lines up with the length of that loop, you're gonna get pooling. And there's even a whole movement called plant pooling and there's plant pooling calculators and people have designed patterns to, to take advantage of that. But for most of us, pooling is kind of a nightmare. And I, I, my, my worst nightmare was I had bought, a, I, I don't know what I was thinking, but I had bought a whole bunch of variegated yarn in yellow and purple. I really don't know what I was thinking because those aren't my colors. <laughs> Not that yellow and purple aren't wonderful, uh, but variegated yellow and purple. So really high contrast, really bold. And I started to knit a sweater in the round. And of course, in the body, it pulled one way. And then I got to the yoke <laughs> and oh my goodness, it was not good. So it's long gone. But that was really my, my I'd say my worst experience with pooling. And then there's a piece in sequence knitting, which I have here, uh, which is a beautiful one row pattern. It's... Um, it's ribs with seed stitch panels between them. So it's an accordion, but this piece pooled and it pooled um, in this part of it, it pooled in a way that you can see uh, kind of blotches. And then um, here it pooled in a way where it makes big, um, big squares, big uh, colorful squares and blue squares. And I think the thing that happened here is when I changed skeins, the pooling behavior changed because I wasn't starting the new skein in the same place. And, you know, you just really, you know, really have to kind of be on your game. And it, I, at some point it, it just sort of takes some of the joy out of the knitting to have to be worrying about that because I, um, I find it very frustrating. So I, I keep this as a, a sample to show my students in classes about the challenges of pooling. And there are different ways you can handle pooling. Uh, and I'll show you another piece. This is a piece called Robson. This is one of my more popular designs. I think a lot of people have enjoyed making it. It's a parallelogram, so it hangs on the bias. And this piece um, I was made from yarn that a friend and I dyed. So this is made from two different skeins of yarn, and we were trying to learn how to paint the yarn randomly, which is a technique that I believe Koigu pioneered, where they would randomly paint a skein of yarn so that uh, it wouldn't pool. And so we had each um, we had each painted a skein trying to develop our or hone our randomization technique. And then this was knit every two rows with those two skeins. And because they were kind of close, because we were sort of aiming for uh, the same idea, you can't even tell where one skein ends and one skein begins. But you know, switching the yarn every two rows is a really great way to handle pooling. But I think the best way to kind of handle pooling is to work with yarns that have a much longer repeat. And, and, and now if you go to a, an event like a Stitches West or a Vogue Knitting Live or Edinburgh Yarn Fest, and you look at the variegated yarns that are available, you'll see that an awful lot of them are dyed um, in a panel. And you can always recognize these yarns because they're usually sold as balls and they look like little bullseyes. Yes. Right, and, that, and they, that's because they're, they're knit in a panel and then they're deconstructed. And I also dyed yarn that way. I, I had a knitting machine for a while. I've given it up because I'm not a machine knitter, I decided. I'm not a spinner or a machine knitter. You can only, you gotta focus. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> I can't do it all. But uh, this is a skein that I dyed myself and it is worked every two rows with silk mohair that's a solid. But this is a very long repeat yarn. So this was knit into a stockinette panel and then painted and then deconstructed. 
And here, ah. it doesn't pool, but you get these beautiful, big, long chain stripes because it was yeah. painted with a long repeat. It was dyed with a long repeat. And all, none of these long repeat yarns will pool. So I think that they're a wonderful way to, um, to, to work. When you want to work with a variegated yarn, the long repeat yarns are a wonderful way to work and not have to worry about pooling. So if you, you've really tried a little bit of a lot of things, haven't you? To... I have. I have. I love, I love playing and learning about different kinds of yarns and how yarns work. Now you said that earlier when you, and I can imagine when you were doing your um, corporate job, you would, you'd probably working long, long hours and then you're writing your book around that. So that's pretty, that's, that's taking up most of your time. So I could imagine that you were, were a fairly isolated knitter back then, but since then, have you got a community of knitters uh, around you that you're able to hang out with and test some of these ideas on? You know, I, I'm so fortunate. Uh, I have, I have, I, I think, kind of two intertwined communities. I, I have a group of local friends who I knit with once a week and uh, wonderful people who live in the Bay Area. And uh, they're really, I would say, um, traditional, typical knitters, by and large. You know, they're not writing knitting books or teaching at events, but they're uh, just wonderful friends and great knitters. And so they're one community. And then since Sequence Knitting came out, I've now got a uh, community of global friends who are really uh, serious knitters and um, have taught me so much and just been so wonderful to, to get to know. For example, the, the people who teach at the knitting events, many of them are now friends of mine. And, uh, and, and I cannot tell you what a joy it has been to be able to be friends with them and talk about knitting ideas at a higher level than I was ever able to before because they're also, I, I don't want to use the word geek maybe, but perhaps. <laughs> yes, um, you, you can use that. <laughs> obs obsessed with making wonderful fabric. <laughs> Well, look, we have to finish the interview here, but it has been a real privilege to have you on Fruity Knitting to see and hear more about sequence knitting and your thinking behind it and how you've developed it and just the beautiful variety of fabrics. They looked so good when they're held up together, like just even in a, in a very basic neutral color. I think that shows them off particularly well. So it's been fantastic to, to have you on the show and I'm really looking forward to our next interview to hear about your, your latest book, Making Miles. So thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a delight. Okay, let's say goodbye to the audience. Bye. Bye. <laughs>